Okay, everybody, let's get started. Um, I'm going to open with a word of prayer, and then we'll spend a few minutes talking about some of the mechanics for the class. Um, always, as the first class of each new course, there's a few details I need to go over, and then we will get into our content for today. The class, of course, is the Letters of Paul. Today we're going to talk about the life of Paul the Apostle, and then we're going to, in the first half of the class, give you a little bit of background on Paul. I'm not going to get into very much of his, his theological content. The last class, uh, the last week of this course, the first half, I'm going to deal with the significance of Paul, and I'm going to speak more there. And we'll talk about his theology in each of the books as we go along through the seven weeks of the course. But at the significance of Paul, I'm going to, I'll talk more specifically about some of his theological things. I'll touch on it a little today and as we go along. But let me open with a word of prayer. Our Father God, we're truly grateful for your grace, for your blessing to us. We thank you for Paul the Apostle, for the fact that he committed his life to you and that through him, you gave us direction as to how we are best to serve and love your Son. And we thank you for the opportunity we have to open this book and pray that you would uh, bless us by your Spirit as we study the letters of Paul and the life of Paul, the message you gave him to give to us, and that we would grow closer to you because of it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, a couple of details. I've been yelling it out every few minutes, but if you didn't sign in back there, do so at the break. I want to make sure I have a, a log of everybody who's in the class. Also, there's a sheet back there. One side of it is a description of all three of the courses. Today's, the one we started yesterday, and the one we're going to have tomorrow, which is Systematic Theology 1. Um, and then the important part for you is this side, which is the reading schedule. You will notice that if you are taking this class, I mean, obviously I encourage you all to read the, the material. But as you're taking this class, there are two kinds of reading assignments. Um, I want you to read the books that we're going to be talking about, ideally the week before. If you have not read the book of Romans in the last week, then you can pick up on that. You can catch up, okay? But then the other reading assignment is from this book, Encountering the New Testament, by uh, Walter Ewell and Robert Yarbrough. And so there are page numbers in here that refer to the sections we're going to be reading. It's not a lot of reading. Um, anybody who panics over that much reading probably didn't learn to read very long ago, because that's not much reading that we have each week, okay? Um, and I mentioned if you're taking the course for credit, let me, let me go over a few policies and requirements. Again, I do this at the start of every class. If you're here yesterday, you've already heard this, or you've heard it in the past. All of our classes, the coursework that we do here in the Lakeside Institute of Theology are free, but um, the only requirement is that if you are taking this for a certificate or a degree, which both of which we are licensed by the government of Mexico to provide, then we ask that you do purchase the books. And I ask that unless there's a very strong reason not, that you buy it in paper rather than um, electronic. <coughs> Nobody is a bigger fan of Kindle than I am. I have the Kindle that just came out two months ago, okay, the 8.9 HDX Kindle uh, tablet. So, and we're huge Kindle fans, but, or electronic book if you, uh, if you use your iPad. But it's very difficult for me to say, read from this page to this page if you're doing it electronically. Or refer to a chart on a certain page or something like that. So if you've got a strong motivation, a strong reason why you really want to get the electronic version rather than buy one of the paper versions, talk to me about it and we'll, we'll figure something out. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not so ironclad that I won't discuss it. It was uh, Michael Whitehead, you all know, was in the courses until fairly recently. He and his family travel a lot. He said, as a rule, they don't own more than they can put in their backpacks. And so I made an exception for him because he wanted to take all the courses and he didn't need to have, you know, a, a packing box full of books. So talk to me if there's, if there's a concern there. Also, students in the certificate or degree uh, programs can only miss one course without special permission. Now, all the classes that you, if you miss classes, you can make them up because the camera is because, as you, most of you know, we record every lecture by video, and they are all on the website, as well as the PowerPoint or PDF, if, they, if that's easier for you to bring up. We have two versions of all of the notes that we, we uh, project. So you can access this stuff online, but you need to talk to me if you're going to be missing a lot of classes or if you're if you're not going to be here in person, because there's there's value to being able to ask questions, to being able to hear other people's questions, which is not always easy to do in the videotape. Um, if you are in the certificate or degree tracks, then you need to um, take the final exam, 
and make a passing grade on the final exam. Now, first, first part of that, let me tell you what the degree tracks are. If you take eight courses divided between Old Testament and New Testament, what we call Christian maturity and theology, uh, eight courses, you can earn a certificate of biblical studies. If you take 12 courses divided amongst those categories, you can get a certificate of biblical maturity, which is the, uh, the biblical studies plus some, uh, like Christian lifestyle kinds of courses. If you take 19 courses, you can get a Master's of Theology. If you take 24 courses, you can get a Master of Theology and Ministry, which is our version of a Master of Divinity, which we, you would get in the States. We are not accredited by any of the, the United States or Canadian. U.S. and Canada join together in their accreditation institutions to provide uh, accreditation. Being in Mexico, we are not under that. So I, if you earn a degree here, you'll have the education, and you'll have a certificate and a degree from us, you can't go to the States and try to use it to get a job that requires a Master of Divinity. I mean, you might talk them into it, you know, if you showed them your, your curriculum vitae and all that, but there's no guarantee because we are not an accredited institution. But we are licensed by the government of Mexico. So if you want to take a certificate, uh, one of the two certificate levels or one of the two degree levels, you do need to take the final exam and make at least a 65 or more on it. If you make less than a 65, I'll allow you to retake it. But, before you get to the final exam, two weeks before the final exam, and I recommend everybody take the exam, even if you're not taking this for credit, because you'll learn more. I will give you a document two weeks before the final exam that tells you everything you need to know, both from this class and in order to pass the final exam. We have an extraordinary number of 100% on our final exam, because if you study the document I give you, you know everything you need to know. Is that not true, those of you who have taken it? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, I will tell you what you need to know. But I encourage you to take the final because you'll learn more by studying for it. Yes? Uh, you took a mark off me because I spelled my name wrong. But, uh... <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> and this is Ron. You'll hear more jokes from him as we go along. Um, and then, if you are wanting to take a Master of Theology or a Master of Theology in Ministry, I ask you at some point along the way that you sit and talk with me because I'd like to talk to you about what your desires are in getting the degree, what your intentions are, mostly to make sure that we're providing you what you need in order to support you in that. Um, we are also at Lakeside Presbyterian Church and therefore Lakeside Institute of Theology because we are connected according to the government of Mexico. We, for reasons I won't get into right now, constitute our own denomination in Mexico because we align ourselves with a Presbyterian church in the USA, PCUSA, which does not exist in Mexico. And so we are not allowed officially to be considered part of that. So we are our own denomination, which means we also can ordain people. We just ordained Guillermo on Sunday. Guillermo Banuet was just ordained as a, as a minister of the gospel on Sunday. That's partly because uh, Guillermo has taken all the courses we've had so far, plus he took all of those courses and more uh, once before at the Reformed Seminary in Guadalajara, and he will finish this out, and then he's teaching these classes in Spanish. So, and he's already serving as pastor of the, uh, our, our Spanish language congregation, but if someone is looking to be ordained for ministry, especially international ministry, that's a possibility too, but I want to talk to you about that, okay? Any questions about policy and requirements, or um, the tests, or any of that kind of stuff? The degrees? And you can feel free to come up and talk to me afterwards if, if you're interested. All right. This is our fifth term. This class is our fifth New Testament class. Um, the letters of Paul, or the Pauline epistle. Somebody asked me why, why it's Pauline. Well, it's the Pauline, an epistle is a letter. Epistle is a fancy, you know, uh, classic name for a letter. So the Pauline epistles are the letters of Paul. Same thing. It's Pauline just like something built by the people from Rome is called Roman whatever, you know, something that is from the people of Mexico is called Mexican. So Paul, Pauline. So Pauline epistles are the letters of Paul. These are the set topics for the seven weeks. The first week, and this is all in your reading schedule, um, first week, today, we are talking about the life and teachings of Paul, and the book, and then the second half will be the book of Romans. Next week, we're going to look at first and second Corinthians, and in each case, I will give you a context for, for where it was written, you know, when it was written, who it was written to, what the needs were, what's being addressed, all of that. Third week will be the books of Galatians and Ephesians. The fourth week, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. The fifth week, First and Second Thessalonians. 
The sixth week, the three little books that are called the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. These uh, Timothy and Titus were uh, sort of apprentices. They were people who, for whom Paul was a mentor and a guide, and he was writing to them to encourage and train them in their ministry. And then week seven, uh, this is previous years we've had eight weeks of courses. We're doing seven this time. I was unable to start the classes two weeks ago, uh, so we're going we're gonna to finish in seven weeks. We'll deal with the significance of Paul, where he stands in terms of, of importance for the faith, and in fact, in world history. Um, every year they come out with a different ranking of who the most important person in history was. Jesus has been named the most important person in history several times. Mohammed has been named the most important person in history. Paul has been named the most important per person in history several times. Because it was Paul that, are, that was anointed, chosen, anointed by God to articulate what the Christian faith was going to be about. From, from the message of Jesus and, the, and what Jesus provided for us in his salvation uh, act of atonement on the cross and resurrection, Paul is the one that interpreted all that in such a way that we can understand it and accept it. And in that way, Paul in many, in many ways is considered the founder of Christianity as a religion. doesn't mean he created it, uh, the faith. It came by inspiration of God. But it was Paul that was chosen by God to communicate to us. So he is a, a terrifically important person historically and certainly for our faith. And then the, the last half of week seven, of course, will be the final exam. Um, this is Paul. And these are photographs that I took in different places. The one on the left is from the, the, the Church of St. Cora in Istanbul. The bottom right is from the Lydia Chapel in uh, Philippi, where Paul, um, Lydia, the dealer in purple cloth, the woman was converted and was baptized by Paul there, and there's now a place where people are commonly baptized at the, the stream, uh, Lydia Stream. The upper right uh, is from the Monastery of St. John in Pat on Patmos. Now, you get the idea that Paul is almost always represented, that these are very similar kind of pictures. He's the one in the middle. You know, the one, uh, the one on the left is Timothy, uh, the one on the right is Luke, all right? But Paul in the middle, He's always shown his ball, or having just a little bit of hair on top. Okay, so he was a handsome man. Um, <laughs> but you always can tell Peter and Paul, for instance, this, this image on the left from the, the uh, Church of St. Cora in Istanbul, Paul is always bald. You will notice he usually is carrying a book or a Bible. He's carrying a scroll down here because of the fact that he wrote 13 of the books that are part of our New Testament. Um, and you, you compare that to Peter. Frequently, Peter and Paul are represented either next to each other, close to one another. Peter always has curly gray hair. He has hair like Norm Pfeiffer. You guys know Norm Pfeiffer. He goes to our church. Um, and Peter is always carrying keys because Peter was given the keys to the kingdom, supposedly. The keys are also the symbol of the, the pope, of the bishop of Rome, because Peter was considered the first pope. So you've got very clear indications. But... Paul is always, he always has a very large head, and he's always bald, he always looks very similar. And so we believe that the, the universality of that image is, uh, that's probably a pretty good idea of what he looked like. Okay? <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about the life of Paul. And you all will have to forgive me for my hoarseness. I have a cold <laughs> all morning. I was just wanting to curl up in a ball someplace, but here we are. And my mouth gets really dry, so, okay. Let's talk about the life of Paul. Paul the Apostle. Um, he is known as St. Paul, Paul the Apostle, the Apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus. The reason he is known as Saul of Tarsus is because of where he's from. This map is the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Um, you may recognize that this is the, you know, this is Italy as we know it. This is Greece, modern day. This area here is what we know of as Turkey. This would be Syria, Lebanon, and down here would be Israel, okay? So this is the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Um, the various cities that are indicated on this map are cities that were of significance to Paul. Paul was born in the city of Tarsus, which was in the Roman province, which was like right here, the Roman province of Cilicia. And um, very important city in its day. In fact, when Alexander the Great was coming through this part of the world in the, the, the late 300s, early, early 200s, um, 
Tarsus was considered one of the most significant cities in the whole Eastern Mediterranean. It was a city that was an important trading capital. It had a major port. It also had a very famous university. One of the reasons we, we believe that Saul was so um, academic, so well-trained, is because he came from a background, from a city, where that was, you know, people, education was highly valued. It was a very intellectual city, and Paul would have learned that. Although, very early in Paul's life, he was Jewish. His father um, was, was a Pharisee, which was one of the parties or schools of Judaism that was very conservative. Paul at one point says, I am a Pharisee, you know, the son of Pharisees, which means very conservative, very committed to the law, very committed to orthodox, serious Jewish faith. And so early in his life, Paul was sent to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he studied at the school of Gamaliel. Gamaliel is mentioned in the New Testament. In fact, Gamaliel shows his wisdom because when the Sanhedrin uh, brings in Peter and John and, and tells them they can't, you know, they can't preach this Jesus, um, they send them out, they come back again, and they've been preaching Jesus again, and they're ready to... Uh, to beat them, stone them, have them killed, something, Gamaliel says, wait a minute, guys. We've had a lot of other people who claim to be the Messiah or claim to represent the Messiah, and either they have their, their movement has fallen apart of its own accord, um, the Romans have done something about it, or it's possible it's true. So leave these guys alone. If it's not true, it'll fall apart. If it is true, then who are we to try to fight against God? Very wise counsel. Of course, the Sanhedrin would listen to him ultimately, eventually, or ultimately. But uh, Gamaliel was the grandson of the great Hillel. And he's always called the great Hillel. Hillel was one of the two most important teachers in the whole history, probably, of the Jewish faith. Okay? The school of Hillel was, the, was run by his grandson Gamaliel in the time of the first century. And Paul, Paul was born right around the time of Jesus, maybe two years later somewhere around 4 BC. We don't know the exact date of Jesus' birth. We think it was probably 6 BC. The people who, who decided zero, you know, from BC to AD, the break in the calendar, they got it wrong. We know now they got it wrong. Um, and so we believe Jesus was probably born around 6 AD. Paul was probably born around 4 AD uh, in Tarsus, went to Jerusalem very early on. We believe that some of his family may also have gone there because his nephew, his sister's son, in the book of Acts, comes, when Paul is under arrest by the Romans, comes and reports that there's a plot to kill Paul. And so they end up spiriting Paul away at night in order to keep him from being ambushed by the, the Jews that wanted to kill him. So we know he had relatives in Jerusalem. At one point he refers to the fact that his mother is in Rome. So, in terms of Paul's life, born in Tarsus, educated in Jerusalem, and lived there, um, it, I'm going to talk in a little while about his conversion. It was on the road between Jerusalem and Damascus that he was converted to Christianity by a miraculous vision of Jesus. He lived most of his uh, adult life in Antioch, Antioch of Pisidia. Antioch was another major city. In the first century, the time of Paul, Antioch was one of the three primary cities of the Roman Empire. There was first Rome, second Alexandria, which was down here in Egypt, and third, Antioch, in terms of size and significance in the empire. So Paul lived in Antioch, and then his travels from Antioch, which was his base of operations throughout his ministry, was into the areas of Asia Minor. There are, this says Galatia. The Roman province of Galatia came all the way down into here. There are several towns. We'll look at another map in a minute because we're going to talk about his missionary journeys. There are a number of towns, Lystra, Derbe, uh, Illyrium, others that he visited. Colossae, which is the town to which he wrote the book of Colossians to the church there. Ephesus, where he spent the longest period of time of any of his missionary travels. He spent almost three years in Ephesus. Uh, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea is, is along here as well. We don't have a book to Berea, so it's not listed. But we do have the book of Philippians, the book of Thessalonians, and then Corinth down here in Greece in the Peloponnesian Peninsula. So we have the two books of uh, the Corinthians. Paul actually wrote four letters to the church in Corinth. We only have two of them. But the other two are referred to, and we'll get into that when we talk about Corinth. And then, of course, Rome, which is where Paul 
was taken uh, after he was arrested for trial. Paul was a Roman citizen, which was not that common for Jews. It wasn't impossible, but you only became a Roman citizen by, by inheriting it, meaning your, your father was a Roman citizen, or you bought it, and it's very expensive. In fact, in the books of, book of Acts, when he gets arrested in Jerusalem, and they actually arrest him in order to keep the Jews from killing him, the, the Romans take him into the guardhouse, the, the Antonia Fortress, and say, um, first thing the commander says is, okay, give him a good beating, and then we'll talk to him. And he said, Paul says, are you in the habit of beating Roman citizens without a trial? Which was illegal. You could do anything you wanted to to anybody else, but a Roman citizen had rights. And Paul said, really? Are you used to, used to beating Roman citizens without trial? He said, you're a Roman citizen? And he said, yes, I am. He said, well, I had to spend a lot of money. The, the commander says, I had to spend a lot of money to get my Roman citizenship. And Paul says, well, I inherited mine. His father was a Roman citizen. You either inherited it, you bought it, or it was granted to you because you did some great service to the empire. Somebody who saved the, the emperor's life or uh, joined the military and was a military hero or something else could be awarded Roman citizenship. If you were a Roman citizen, you had very specific rights. You couldn't be beaten, you could never be crucified, which is why tradition says that whereas Peter was crucified in Rome, Paul was also martyred in Rome by tradition, but he was beheaded, he was not crucified, because Roman citizens could not be crucified. You had to be tried uh, before anything could be done to you, you had those rights, and you had a right always to appeal, if you were accused of something, you could appeal to Rome which Paul does when he was arrested and held in Caesarea. He appealed to Caesar in Rome, and so they had to take him to Rome for trial. He had that right. So being a Roman citizen was very important. Uh, <clears throat> again, this just reflects a lot of the different places where Paul ended up having an influence, spending time, even Malta, this little island. The reason is because when Paul was taken by ship from Caesarea, which would be right along here, which was the main Roman military center in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean, Caesarea Maritima. From there, he was taken by boat, and they had a couple of places where they stopped, and they actually were getting late in the year. There were great storms in the Eastern Mediterranean if you get into wintertime, and it was getting late, and Paul warned him, you better not try this. They did anyway, and they ended up, it, usually if you see a map of his, of his trip to Rome, there will be a section in here that zigzags up and down because they had a, a giant storm and they were shipwrecked on Malta. And so he spent some time on Malta. Before he then, they got another boat to take them up to, to uh, Rome. Okay? Any questions about just that general location uh, and, and Paul's life in that part of the world? Let me talk a little bit more about it. Again, uh, Paul was known as a young man for his religious piety. He identified himself as a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees. In fact, in Philippians 3, he says he is of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. So he was very serious as a young Jewish leader. A student of Gamaliel meant he was one of the best trained. He had every indication that he was going to rise in the ranks and become a leader in the Jewish faith. In fact, what happened is, uh, in terms of his history, is when the Christian sect started, when, which, and all the early believers in, in Jesus as the Messiah were all Jewish. All the early Christians were Jewish. Well, when people started professing faith in Jesus, these Jews started professing faith that Jesus was the Messiah that God had promised for so long. I said a few minutes ago, you know, Peter and John, for instance, are preaching and uh, the Sanhedrin calls him in and says, stop it, because this guy was crucified and you're making us look bad and you're undermining our authority and we don't think this guy had anything to do with being the Messiah, so stop preaching this. They sent him back out, they kept preaching it. And so the Sanhedrin started to take action and it began with the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Stephen was one of the first deacons of the church and he was an evangelist and a preacher. And we read in the book of Acts that they confront Stephen, and uh, Stephen gives him what for? He gives him this long sermon where he addresses the whole history of the Jewish people as evidence of building up to the Messiah who is Jesus. Well, in their fury, 
the Jews who were present stoned Stephen to death, the first Christian martyr. And Paul, who at that time was known as Saul, Saul of Tarsus. One of the things about scripture I'm sure you've noticed is that it's quite frequent for people's names to get changed when they have a major spiritual event in their life. Abra Abram became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. Jacob became Israel. Saul becomes Paul. Simon became Peter. Okay? So Saul of Tarsus, who was this, this very energetic, um, legalistic, Pharisaic Jew, held the cloaks of the men who stoned Stephen to death. He was present at the first martyrdom, first Christian martyr. He held their cloaks. Then Saul went to the Sanhedrin and got um, letters from them giving him the authority to go and arrest these Jews who were worshiping Jesus as the Messiah. And he, Paul himself says he went house to house, dragged them out into prison. In all likelihood, these people were tortured. And Saul, not yet Paul, was responsible for that. Then, in the, um, this, again, another picture of, of Paul, and see, big bald head, right? Um, and carrying a book. These, these are all symbols of his, uh, of his sainthood, if you will. This map, and, and by the way, I put these things up here knowing you can't read all of that, but all of this is online. So if you want to go on and pull these things up from our website, you not only have the videos there, but you also have all of this material. So you can pull it up, print it out, read it, study it, use it for your, you know, your own uh, things. He, um, Paul from Tarsus, originally, grew up in Jerusalem as a young man, again, witnessed the martyrdom of Stephen, started persecuting the Jews. He was so intent on maintaining the Jewish law that he was persecuting the Jews who followed Jesus. He then got permission to go to Damascus in Syria in order to arrest Jew Jewish Christians who had fled there. On the road to Damascus, he has an extraordinary experience. He sees a bright light, and this, by the way, there's, this is such an important event that there's three different accounts of it in the book of Acts alone. In Acts 9, in Acts 22, and Acts 26, it's repeated. <coughs> Um, Paul is riding on his donkey with companions on his way to Damascus to arrest these Jews who believe in Jesus as the Messiah. He sees a bright light. He hears a voice from heaven that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, Saul, says, who are you, Lord? He's got enough sense to refer to what this voice from heaven is, Lord. And the answer is, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The light and the voice was so overwhelming, knocked him off of his donkey, he was blinded. His companions had seen the light, but they did not hear the voice, and they didn't know what was going on. But they led him into Damascus. He went there, and he's blind, he's stricken, he doesn't know what's going on. God sends a message to a man named Ananias of Damascus. And Ananias is sent to Saul. And Ananias, when he gets this vision, his response is saying, um, but this is the guy who's been persecuting the believers, the brothers and sisters of the Lord. God says, I know what I'm doing. Go <coughs> anoint him, baptize him, explain the faith to him. So Ananias of Damascus goes to the street called Straight. There's a long straight street in Damascus. It is still there today. The street called Straight. And Paul was staying in a house there. Ananias of Damascus goes there. He um, blesses Paul. Paul's vision returns. His blindness is healed. He, Ananias explains what has happened to him and the significance. Paul, Saul at that point, accepts that this really was Jesus who was crucified, that all these people who had been following him, Saul had been persecuting. He believes in Jesus, he is baptized, and is converted to the faith. That is the Damascus Road experience. It's so dramatic and so important to the Christian faith that the expression, a Damascus Road experience, is sometimes used now for any really dramatic event. You know, something that really changes somebody's life is now called the Damascus Road experience. It's because of what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. At that point, he's in Damascus. 
He can now see he believes in Jesus, and we don't have a lot of detail, but the indication is that one of the first things he does is he goes off into Arabia. Tradition says he went all the way down to Mount Sinai, which he later, um, in Galatians, refers to Sinai being in Arabia, which is interesting because that's consistent with modern theories that Sinai is, that uh, Mount Sinai is not on the Sinai Peninsula, but rather is on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba, which is in, in Egypt. Uh, or in uh, Arabia. I'll, we'll talk about that later on. We'll get to Galatians, okay? But the idea is he goes off, he studies, he prays, he then ends up coming back to Damascus. At one point, he goes from Damascus down to, to Jerusalem. This, this little line here means he went down here to Arabia. Um, he went down to Jerusalem. He meets Peter and James. He does not really get involved in the activities of the church. After a while, he goes back to Tarsus, his hometown, and Barnabas, the son of encouragement, one of the most important and, and wonderful figures in the New Testament. We don't have a lot about him. Um, it, there's some theories that Barnabas may have been who wrote, the one who wrote the book of Hebrews. But he is always the one who is mending fences. He is the one who is trusted by everyone. Barnabas has gone to Antioch. And there are, a church has started in Antioch. He goes, Barnabas goes up to Tarsus and finds Saul. Takes him back to Antioch to help him with this new church. As they're preaching, Gentiles start converting to the faith. Gentiles become Christians. The first Gentile to become a Christian was actually um, right in here. Um, it was Peter's ministry to uh, Cornelius, a Roman centurion, and his family. They became the first Gentile Christians. But the first church, which was predominantly Gentile, was in Antioch, and it was because of the ministry of Barnabas and Saul. So Barnabas and Saul are responsible for uh, leading a number of Gentiles to the faith. This ends up, and we read about this in Acts 15, in a major event at this time of the church, where uh, the church in Jerusalem... A number of Jewish Christians have come to Jerusalem and they tell the, the council of the church, the elders of the Christian church in Jerusalem, all of whom are Jewish. They are led by James, the brother of Jesus, okay, uh, a younger brother of Jesus by Mary and Joseph. James, the brother of Jesus, called James the Lesser, he is the, the senior elder, the moderator of the council of Jerusalem. They invite Peter and Barnabas and Saul to come to Jerusalem to figure out what are we going to do with these Gentile Christians. Jewish Christians we've had. We know what to do with them. But what about these Gentile Christians? They're not circumcised. They don't obey the law. What do we do? They brought them down there and Saul and Peter and Barnabas are primary people who testify that God has anointed these people. He's called them to himself. He's given them the gifts of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's with them. We, we shouldn't lay any other burden on them. The question was, if a Gentile becomes a believer in Jesus, does he have to be circumcised? Does he have to obey the law? No more bacon. No more shellfish. Okay? No more walking more than a quarter of a mile or so on the Sabbath. Does a Gentile have to obey the Jewish law in order to be a follower of Jesus? And in Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem decided... No, they do not. And it was significantly because of Peter's experience with converting Gentiles, but especially Paul and Barnabas in Antioch, the church there, where they, the church in Jerusalem, the council in Jerusalem decided a Gentile does not have to obey the Jewish law in order to be a follower of Jesus, something for which we are all grateful. Okay. So um, you've got the church in Antioch, it's growing. Uh, Paul and Barnabas are actively involved in leading it. And then Paul and Barnabas leave on the first missionary journey. Paul ended up actually having three, you might say four, if you count the one that his trip to, um, to, to Rome as missionary journeys. But the first missionary journey, Antioch became their base of operations for everything. They worked with the church there. That was their support, their prayer support, everything else. But... Um, Barnabas and Saul, and at this point it's important to note that Barnabas was considered the leader at this point, when they, when they started on the first missionary journey. They left Antioch, 
They went to Cyprus, landed at Salamis, crossed <coughs> Cyprus, the island of Cyprus to Paphos, and then sailed up to Perga, ended up visiting Antioch of Pisidia, it's called Antioch of Pisidia, or Pisidian Antioch, to separate it from Antioch of Syria, which was a much bigger city. They visited Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, and then back again. When they returned back down here to Atalia, which uh, is now called Anatalia, it's a city on the coast of Turkey, uh, then they, they took a boat back to, uh, back to Antioch. Now, along the way, as I say, Saul was the second fiddle to Barnabas. When they reach um, Perga, they have an incident where they're, uh, they're ministering all along the way. At one point, there's a magician named Elimus, and Elimus starts speaking negatively about the gospel they're spreading, and Paul curses him. He goes blind, and it's such a demonstration of power at that point, and that's the point at which they start calling him Paul instead of Saul. From that point on, instead of it being Barnabas and Saul, it's Paul and Barnabas. And Paul takes leadership then. It's at that point that God, the Holy Spirit, makes it clear that Paul is to be the primary player in this missionary effort. Now, when they got here, whoops, sorry. When they got here, uh, they had also been accompanied by John Mark. <coughs> John Mark was a cousin of Barnabas's. John Mark you know about because of the Gospel of Mark. He wrote it. John Mark was traveling with, uh, with Paul and Barnabas, but he gets to Perga, and we think it might be, we don't know for sure, but we think it might be because he was not happy that Paul started taking the lead, since Barnabas was his cousin. John Mark decides he doesn't want to travel with him anymore, and he leaves and goes back to Jerusalem. That was important because on the second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with him again, and Paul said no, and they had a falling out, and ended up not traveling together after that. But John Mark traveled with him as far as Perga, and then he quit and went home. So this is the first missionary journey, and then everywhere along this way, the way here, they planted churches. This area, while it's called, it's the... Asia or Asia Minor, these Lyconia, Phrygia, uh, Cilicia, Pisidia, Pamphylia, Lycia, Cyprus, the Romans had realigned some of these provinces according to their own administrative desires, and all of this area was considered Galatia. Galatia before that had been further north in Asia Minor, but they called this whole province Galatia. Okay? And those became the churches of Galatia that Paul writes to later when he writes the letter of Galatians. These churches here, Antioch, Iconia, Lystra, Derby. Now, some people disagree with that. Some people think that Paul, without telling us about it, in his second missionary journey, went further north into the, into the ancient province of Galatia, not the Roman province, and that he visited churches up there and the, the letter of Galatians is written to them. I don't think we need to go there. I think that because the Romans called this Galatia, I think those are the churches he wrote to, and that's the predominant idea right now, okay? So when you read the book of Galatians, he's writing it to these churches he, he planted, he and Barnabas planted on their first missionary journey. Got that? Well, they weren't done yet. They then had a second missionary journey. Now again, before this missionary journey started, Saul, or Paul now, and Barnabas had a falling out over whether John Mark could go with them again. And so Barnabas takes, uh, from Antioch, Barnabas takes John, uh, John Mark, and they go to Cyprus together. Silas, another friend and follower, joins with Paul, and they go over land, from Antioch over Cilicia. Actually, we're told he visited Tarsus. I don't know why this map doesn't show that. And he revisited some of the churches that they had gone to before, Derby, Lystra, Iconium. Along the way, they meet up with a young man who's going to become very important in the church. His name is Timothy. Timothy, who had a, a, a Jewish Christian mother and a Gentile father, and he became one of the most important followers of Paul. They travel over land, and the indication is Paul was wanting to go first down into more southern Asia, but he says we were prevented from doing so. We don't know why. He ends up traveling more north and goes to Troas, which is very near the site of the ancient city of Troy, right here on the coast of the Aegean Sea. So it's on the coast of Asia Minor, what we know of as Turkey, and at Troas, a very important thing, thing happens. Paul 
has a vision of a man of Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is over here. It's, it's this area here. This area, Ikea, Greece, um, or what we know as Greece. But Paul had a vision of a Macedonian man saying, come and help us. And in response to that, Paul decides that God has called him to go across the Aegean Sea to Europe. See, this is Asia. This is Europe. The city of Byzantium, which is now called Istanbul, in between it was called Constantinople after Emperor Constantine in the 300s, is, is a capital city that sits on two continents. It's the only city in the world that literally is on two continents. Half of it's in Asia and half of it's in Europe. Well, Paul had a vision to cross over, and so he gets a boat, they go halfway and stop at an island overnight, and then they go on to the port of Neapolis. And from there, he then travels to the town of Philippi. From Philippi, he visits a number of other cities, Thessalonica, and he runs into real trouble in Thessalonica. They're, they're, uh, the Jews who are there don't like what he's saying, and so they go down to the local market and they hire a bunch of thugs <clears throat> to chase him off. And so they, they have to get out of town really quick, and they go to Berea. My college, I went to Berea College, and it's named after that town because it says in Scripture that the Bereans were, were um, humbly open to the Word of God. So from Berea, these guys in Thessalonica heard that they'd gone on to Berea and were preaching there, and they went all that distance to, to try to harass them again. So they had to sneak Paul out under cover of night. He catches a boat, and he goes down the coast to Athens, the capital city and the center of Greek culture as we know it, the site of the golden age of Greece. In Athens, everybody was a philosopher. Everybody was interested in things about philosophy and religion and all that. And Paul starts witnessing first to the Jews in Athens, and later on, he goes up on the Areopagus. You've heard of Mars Hill? Mars Hill is the same as Areopagus. Mars is the Roman name for the Greek god Ares. Aresopolis, Mars Hill, same thing. It's literally a giant rock that's right at the foot of the Acropolis. Have any of you all been there? Okay, if, you're, if you've been to the Acropolis, you come down the exit of the Acropolis and just forward over to the right a little bit, you know, a couple, a few hundred yards, um, is this rock. And there's steps that go up on it. It's flat on top, and the philosophers would go there and argue philosophy, especially they liked it when somebody had a new philosophy. Well, Paul went there and preached to these philosophers, and he had a unique way of doing it. Now, Paul, we, we get an indication here and elsewhere. Paul quotes Stoic philosophers. Stoicism was one of the most popular of the, of the Greek philosophies. And in fact, um, Tarsus, where he came from, was a center of Stoic, uh, Stoic philosophy. He, he quotes several other different philosophers from different schools. He proved he was a very learned man, and they listened to him. And he does this beautiful thing. He said, you know, I see that you all are very religious people here in Athens because I wander around the city and everywhere I go there are different altars and shrines to this god and that god and some other god. And I finally came across one that said, to the unknown god. And Paul said, I'm here to tell you that's the only real one. Now the... the the Athenians, the Greeks, had put that up so because they always thought if there's some god that we didn't recognize, that we didn't build a shrine to, he might get mad and hurt us. And so they put one up to just sort of cover their bases, to the unknown god. And Paul said, that's the real one. And he preached to them about the one true god and about God's son, Jesus, and how what had happened, the whole story of Jesus. So he didn't have a didn't sink in awfully well. They did tell him, you can come back and talk to us some more, but then people started opposing him. From Athens, he then went down to Corinth. Corinth was a city also in Greece. It was a major port city. Actually, it had two ports. It had a port on the Aegean Sea on this side, and then it had a port on this side, because it's uh, Corinth is right on this very narrow isthmus, and it was a very wealthy city, because instead of, when, when boats were coming from Rome or other places in the west, they had two choices. They could either sail all the way around this Peloponnesian Peninsula, which was a long way to sail, and it was rough water and dangerous. Or they could pull in here at Corinth, and if the ship wasn't too big, they would unload all the cargo and take it in wagons across an area that was about three miles long to the other, 
to the other side, the other harbor, and they would put the ship on rollers and move it across, put it back in the water, and reload it. And people paid for that. And it was less expensive and less dangerous than going this way. So the city of Corinth was very wealthy. It was a significant center of um, religion. They had several different temples there. Paul went there, planted a church, and preached everywhere he went, with the exception of Athens. Paul planted a church. There was a church at Philippi that he wrote to later, the letter to the Philippians. There was a church at Thessalonica. Uh, apparently there were believers at Berea, but he, we, we don't know of any letters he wrote there. Uh, he wrote to the church in Corinth. From Corinth, he then went back across the Aegean Sea to Ephesus. This was his first visit. Ephesus, again, a major city. He spent time there, planted a church. He would come back there later. From there, he then took a boat back down to Caesarea, here, then to Jerusalem, and then back up to Antioch. That was his second missionary journey. Then we have Paul's third missionary journey. One of the things that Paul did a lot is he would go back, and as much as he could, visit the churches he planted to make sure they were doing well, to encourage them, to teach them, etc. The third missionary journey, as they all do, started in Antioch. He went overland again, um, visiting some of the places, and he went to Ephesus. He visited there before. It was a major cosmopolitan center. Have any of you all been to Ephesus? You really got to go to Ephesus. It is one of the most important, most extraordinary archaeological sites in the world. Um, can't even describe it. I'll bring some pictures as we get in, when we get to Ephesians, and we'll, you'll you'll see some images from there. And you will have, you will have seen pictures of it. Trust me, because it's one of the most photographed archaeological sites in the world, especially the Library of Celsus that is there. So he went to Ephesus, and he spent somewhere between two and three years there. And I say somewhere between because in the, in the New Testament, they always round up. And it says three years, but when we add up sort of the, the chronology, it appears he was there two, two and a half years or something like that. Teaching every day, and we know that he taught at a, um, in a building called the, um, the, the something of Tyrannus. What's it called? The Hall of Tyrannus. And a number of us, my old pastor said this, and I feel the same way. We are still hopeful because most of Ephesus has not yet been uncovered. Most of it's still under dirt because the city had been abandoned. Um, we hope that someday they may actually uncover something that because a lot of things have labels on them, you know, stone signs. Someday they may find the Hall of Tyrannus, which we know was where Paul lectured every afternoon for the two and a half years or so that he was in Ephesus. So he strengthened the church there. From Ephesus, he crossed over back up to Thessalonica and revisited some of the locations here. He went back down to Corinth and visited Corinth because they were having a lot of problems. Corinth was known for a, a city that, <coughs> as a city that was very immoral. They had a temple to Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and so temple prostitutes wandered the streets all the time. And it was considered an act of worship to pay a prostitute for sex. And so they even had an expression back then to Corinthianize, meant to make something, to do something immoral. And so he went back to Corinth, and then he was planning to take a boat back, but he discovered that there were a bunch of Jews who were, who were planning to do him ill. So rather than get on a boat back to Jerusalem, which would have been with a lot of Jewish people he thought might, might want to do him in, he decided to go back by land. And so he headed back north, up into Macedonia, and then he crossed over um, this way to Troas, Assos, he sort of skipped by Ephesus this time, and he indicates it's because he was afraid if he stopped there, they wouldn't let him go, and he wanted to try to get back to Jerusalem. He went by boat, having several stops, ended up coming back to Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey, and at that point, Paul gets back to, um, to Jerusalem. When he arrives, James, the brother of Jesus, the head of the Jerusalem church, tells him, Paul, there are Jews here who are out to get you because they hear you have been preaching against Moses' law, telling people they had to deny the law. And, and <clears throat> Paul actually had not preached that. He was preaching that the law was not required anymore, but he hadn't spoken against the law or the temple or Moses. He said, Jesus and what Jesus gives us fulfills the law. But just because he'd been warned and he didn't want to create a problem he didn't have to, Paul goes through a ritual of purification in the hopes, a Jewish ritual of purification, in the hopes that uh, that will keep them from being upset with it. He goes into the temple grounds, and because he had been seen with a Gentile Christian in the town, 
a bunch of Jews jump on him in the temple courtyards, and they start beating him up. And they're, they're screaming that he had brought a Gentile into the Jewish temple, which was against the law. In fact, there were signs as you entered the temple that said, if you are not a Jew and you enter this, then your life, you're taking your life in your own hands. Basically, if we kill you, it's your own fault. Well, they're making such a, a riot over, over beating Paul up that the Romans, whose headquarters are right next to the temple grounds, the Antonia Fortress, the Roman center there in Jerusalem, is right, literally opens up into the temple courtyards. They hear this, they come out, they grab Paul, they take him back into the Antonia Fortress. And I told you earlier, the first thing they were going to do is beat him, and they find out he's a Roman citizen. And so they don't beat him. They bring him back out to the Sanhedrin, under guard, and Paul goes in very wise. The Sanhedrin was made up of Sadducees and Pharisees, the two main parties of the Jews at that time. They had theological differences and political differences. One of the theological differences, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, and they believed in all of the Old Testament as being God's word. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in angels and demons. They didn't believe any of the Bible except the books of Moses, the first five, of the Old Testament were valid. Well, Paul is a Pharisee. He comes into this group, and they're beginning to accuse him of all sorts of things. And he says, the reason I'm here, the reason you guys are accusing me, is because I've been preaching the resurrection of the dead. Well, this is a major thing that the Sadducees and the Pharisees fought over. Well, the minute that Paul said that, the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin all went, yeah, we like him. He's a good guy. <laughs> And the Sadducees are going, no, no, he's wrong. And so the Sadducees and the Pharisees start fighting in the Sanhedrin. And the Roman guards go, hey. And they grab Paul and take him back, take him away. Because the Sanhedrin's having their own little riot at that point. And Paul knew what he was doing when he did that. So they take him back into the, the barracks of the Antonia Fortress, the Roman garrison. And Paul's nephew... His, his sister's son comes and said to tell them, I've just found out that there are a group of Jews who have said they are not going to eat or drink until they kill Paul. They have committed themselves, they have pledged themselves to murder Paul. Well, when the, the commander of the garrison hears that, the guy who's found out that Paul is a Roman citizen, he knows if he lets a Roman citizen get murdered, then he's going to be held accountable for it. Because the Roman guards, were, or the soldiers, were responsible to protect Roman citizens. So he sends word to Caesarea, which is the main center, the, the headquarters of the Roman army. And he says, this is what's going on. Um, I saved this guy. He sort of brags a little bit about it in a, in a not quite true way. He says, I saved this guy, and now uh, I understand he's in threat of ambush, and so I'm going to bring him up there. And he gets a huge contingent of soldiers and cavalrymen, and they... They travel the distance up to Caesarea, take Paul up there. Paul ends up being in Caesarea for about a year and a half. He's well treated, but he's kept imprisoned. And the, uh, the first guard, the first governor, I'm sorry, uh, Felix, who was there, was kind of a nasty guy. And the indication is he probably kept Paul there for a year and a half and did not decide his fate because he kept hoping Paul would offer him a bribe. Or that the Sanhedrin who wanted Paul back, they kept saying they wanted him to come back to Jerusalem so they could try him, um, and they sent representatives up to Caesarea to try to convince him. Felix kept thinking that either Paul or the Sanhedrin will pay me a bribe. When they didn't, Felix got in all kinds of trouble with Rome, and he was ousted, and they brought in a new governor who was very good, Festus. And Festus comes in, and he immediately decides to deal with this problem with Paul. And... Uh, Agrippa, you know, one of the sons of Herod Agrippa the Great, comes in. They become friends. They all listen to Paul. They're all kind of oppressed by Paul. But Paul says, I'm not going to be tried by the Sanhedrin. I have, I'm a Roman citizen. I have rights, and I appeal to Rome. And Festus says, if you appeal to Rome, to Rome you will go. You have that right. And so Paul then journeys to Rome. From... Uh, Caesarea, here, he is taken up to uh, Sidon, they catch a boat, and as I told you earlier, they sort of stop at a couple of different places, at Rhodes, Crete, when they head from Crete, they get out here, and again, usually there's a, because they have a big storm, Paul told them it would happen, he told them that there would be a storm, 
uh, that they would, wouldn't make it. They shipwreck at Malta, finally get another boat. They make it up here, and he's taken to Rome. At Rome, he is under house arrest for two years. That's where the book of Acts ends. Okay, the book of Acts is the one that records most of Paul's life. So in addition to the letters of Paul, we learn a lot there because of who he's writing to and where he's writing from and what he says. But the book of Acts, more than half of the book of Acts is about the life of Paul. The book of Acts ends there. And again, some people have thought uh, this was in the time of Nero, that Paul was executed at that point. But there is a very strong tradition that Paul was not executed, that after two years of being imprisoned, house arrest in Rome, and he was allowed to preach in Rome, there was a church in Rome already, because when, when Stephen, the deacon, was martyred, a lot of the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem spread out. Diaspora, it's called, a spreading out. Some of them went to Damascus, that's why Paul, when he was still Saul, was going to Damascus to arrest them. They went all over. Some of them went to Rome. And we believe because they were believers in Jesus, when they went to Rome and to Alexandria, later Apollo comes from Alexandria, and he's already a Christian. These people, when they ran from the Sanhedrin, from the Jewish persecution, they went to all these other cities, and there they planted churches. People became Christians by their testimony. So there were Christians in Rome before Paul got there, before Peter ever showed up there. And so... We have Christians, Paul is preaching, he's encouraging the church, he's converting people to Christ. Some people believe he died at that first visit to Rome, but we have a number of first and second century testimonies that Paul was released. Clement of Rome said that Paul was the herald of the gospel of the West, that he had gone to the extremity of the West, which would mean Spain. Paul says in Romans that he wants to go to Spain. He's writing to the church in Rome, and he says, I want to come by and visit you on my way to Spain. That's before he, you know, before he ever got to Rome. Uh, St. John Chrysostom said that Paul preached in Rome, quote, for after he had been in Rome, he returned to Spain, but whether he came thence again into these parts, we do not know. Cyril of Jerusalem says that he had, uh, in his earnestness, carried his preaching as far as Spain. The Muratorian Fragment, one of our earliest documents of the Christian faith, says that Paul departed from the city of Rome when he journeyed to Spain. So we have an indication that Paul actually was released and ended up fulfilling his desire to go as far as Spain. There also are records in Spain about Paul coming there to preach. None of this is ironclad, but there's real strong traditional evidence for it. So some people <laughs> believe that when Paul left Rome, he left and visited several places, and then went to Spain to, um, to visit several parts of Spain. There is even some tradition that he went around the Iberian Peninsula and as far as Britain, the, to the extremes of the West. Roman Britain was the furthest West anybody knew about at that point. Okay, So whether he got that far, whether he even got to Spain, we don't know for a fact, but there is strong traditional belief that he may have made it to Spain, maybe even to Britain, and then ended up coming back to Rome where he was arrested again under a, a, a new persecution of the Christians and was martyred and beheaded somewhere around 62 AD. Okay? Um, yes? How can you have such a, a networking of, of all of this and then for him just to just fade away? And also wouldn't the Romans have had... An accounting of this that he had been? No, the, to the Romans, he was insignificant. Again, we think of Paul and think, wow, everybody's going to pay attention to Paul. He was just, he was a guy that was in jail. They, had, they did not account for him being important at all. Um, again, when we say, well, don't we have some record? We have uh, at least four or five different accounts from the first and early second century that Paul did leave and go to Spain. Now, there was no church in Spain. If he went to Spain, then he was planting, he was, you know, uh, uh, evangelizing. Again, there are some traditional records there. But for one thing, nobody kept historical records the way we think about historical records in that time. Um, the, the issue of keeping dates and records of that sort of thing, there was not the priority. That's why we don't know the exact year Jesus was born, or the exact year that Paul was born. There was not the same orientation toward calendars back then, or events linked to calendars. Um, we, we do have... The traditions. I mean, that's the record we have, and that's why I say there's pretty good indication that Paul may have not 
died the first time he was in Rome, but left, visited Spain, maybe even visited Britain, and then come back. But this tradition is very, very strong that he was beheaded uh, somewhere around AD 62 in Rome uh, under another of the, of the Christian persecutions. Okay? So that's the life of Rome. And again, it is hard for us because we think about, you know, somebody's got to be writing stuff down. But that, that wasn't typical back then. But I thought they had an accounting of everybody having to register, like when uh, when uh, Joseph and Mary had to go back. Well, yeah. only when they only when they counted census, and that only happened, you know, just like we have them every ten years. It was very, it was not regular. It was just periodically, and mostly it was whenever the Roman emperor decided I need more taxes. Then he would call for a census because the census is how he got an exact count of the people and figured out how much money he should be getting from them. That was the main purpose of the census, which is why a lot of people in the United States really don't like the census, because that's what they're afraid of. You know, people who are of questionable immigration status don't like it because they think they're going to use it, even though they keep swearing, this is, nobody's going to get in trouble. You know, nobody, this doesn't affect your taxes. Everybody's afraid they're going to, because from the time of the Romans, that's what the census was for. Somebody, else? yes? I, uh, correct me on this, but I think that Spain really, um, uh, that Paul was there and has a main through away through affair that is that uh, each uh, is it each year that people go actually you're thinking of St. James oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. and that That's is good. you know the Compostela which is up here okay. the story is in the far north the story is that St. James okay. who St. James was the first of the apostles to be martyred and so it's very hard to believe that he actually had time to do what they claim he did. But they believe that St. James, uh, the um, Santiago de Compostela is the city, that St. James came all the way to Spain, ministered in Spain, and then went all the way back to Jerusalem before he was martyred. And that, his martyrdom was very early. He was the first apostle to die. Um, and yet they believe that St. James came to, to Spain, and so he's the patron saint of Spain. Um, and there's a lot of stuff having to do with that. Yes? Uh, Ross, i got two questions. One is, um, you're talking about Paul being accused uh, by the council that he was denigrating the law. Right. Is that, and I know Romans is inspired by God, but, but he defends, in Romans 7, he defends the law. And right. it shows how Jesus supersedes the law. Right. Could he have been influenced by that criticism when he wrote that? I think he wrote it in Corinth. Well, I mean, obviously that would have influenced him, but even more so he was influenced because of his being a Jew and his relating to Jewish people. Seeing, you know, once he became a Christian and understood the grace of Christ, seeing the burden that the law was and that the... You know, the Jewish leadership, the Jewish religious authorities were causing that to be such a burden on the Jewish people. I think most of Paul's reaction and most of what we find recorded in Romans and elsewhere having to do with the Jewish burden of the law and how that was not necessary anymore had to do with the fact he himself was a Jew and knew what it was to be under that and then released from it. Yeah, but the but point I was making was that he, he, he defends the validity of the law. Oh, yes, he does. And so, I mean, it's like it's, it's kind of out of context there. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that the law is a great thing, you know, that it is the law of God, but it is completed now. We don't have to add the end of that burden. So. The other question was, uh, when he and Barnabas went on their first trip to Crete, and mm -hmm. Salamis and Paphos, is there any residue? Cyprus, there? not Crete. Cyprus, Crete's further east, yeah. Uh, was there any residue? I mean, you don't hear of any churches there, or you've been there. Yeah, there are churches there. In fact, later but on... He, they were not, what, did they leave anything? Uh, Titus ended up being the bishop of Crete, um, or of Cyprus, I mean, and um, there is a temple, there is a, a cathedral there now, there's a lot of churches, and there is one church there now, which is the church of, of Bishop Titus, and I told several of you, they have his skull there, and what they've done is there's this gold thing that looks like a soccer ball or something, um, gold filigree with jewels and the whole thing, and the top of it's open, and you can look in the top of it and see the top of Titus' skull. And this is Titus, who was an assistant and, hmm. and a hmm. disciple of Paul's, who he wrote to is the book of Titus. And so, yeah, you know, Cyprus churches were planted there, and later on, because those churches were there, um, Titus goes back to be bishop and became, like, the I think Titus is the patron saint of uh, Cyprus. So, and there's, and the, 
there are especially it's mostly Orthodox churches there, you know, because they came under the the auspices of the uh, Greek Orthodox Church. So, uh, and actually, if you guys know uh, Danny and Kay Korkowski, they were in ministry on Cyprus for many many years, um, working with the Anglican Church. There. But the the Orthodox Church is the most is the largest. Okay, let's take a break for a few minutes. Okay, I want to spend a few minutes talking about, in general, the epistles or the letters of Paul, and then we're going to spend most of the uh, rest of the 45 minutes we have on the book of Romans. Paul, um, of the 27 books in the New Testament, Paul is credited with writing 13 of them. There was a, uh, quite a few years in which people also um, claimed that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, but... I don't believe anybody really thinks now that Paul wrote Hebrews. It is so completely different than everything else Paul wrote. Uh, it is not contrary to what Paul wrote, but it is uh, very different in terms of its style, in terms of its theological themes, etc. And so the book of Hebrews, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, I, I'm inclined to think that it probably was, was Priscilla, of Priscilla and Aquila, but we don't know. It might have been Barnabas, could have been Apollo. Uh, but we don't know. But we do, there are 13 books in the New Testament from Romans to uh, Philemon that we do believe Paul wrote. Now, I say we do believe Paul wrote. Seven of those are universally accredited to Paul. There are the other six, some scholars question whether Paul actually wrote them. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, in terms of an order... This gives you the chronological order rather than the order in the Bible. The order that's in the Bible, and this is true Old Testament and New Testament, is in no way chronological. You need to know that. It's not the order in which they were written. Romans to Philemon is put in that order because Romans is longer and Philemon is the shortest. So it goes from longest to shortest. I don't know who thought that was a good idea, but they did. It so happens that Romans is probably, of all Paul's letters, the most important in terms of the universality of its theology, but Paul, Romans comes first in the letters of Paul because it's the longest of Paul's letters. This, which again, you can access this online and see this chart, is the order of chronology, when they were written. And there's even a little bit of disagreement about that. I agree with this list that has Galatians first. I believe that the first book that was written in the New Testament was the book of James, written by... James the Lesser, who is the brother, uh, half-brother of Jesus. The next book written is Galatians. Now, these books were all written before the Gospels were written, for instance. Galatians, and then Paul wrote 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and then 1 and 2 Corinthians, then Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy. And this chart is nice because it tells you who he's writing to, where it was written, when it was written, and what the theme is. Now, when it says when it was written, we have some, there's some disagreement about that. Again, because they were not as hung up on exact dates back then as we are. They just didn't think that was that important. Um, but this does give you a pretty good uh, general consensus. This chart will tell you what they're about. Galatians, the first of his letters, was written to the churches of Galatia, those churches he planted in his first missionary journey and then revisited in the second journey. Um, and he was writing because some Jewish Christians had gone to the Galatians after he'd been there and told them they did have to be circumcised. They did have to become Jews in order to become Christians. So he's writing that the necessity of salvation by grace rather than law in Galatians. First and second Thessalonians are instructions about the coming of the Lord for the church at Thessalonica. Somebody had told the, the, the Christians at Thessalonica that Jesus had already come back a second time and they had missed it. And so Paul is writing to them to clear, clear this up and straighten out some of the problems. First and Second Corinthians is written to the church in Corinth. Instructions in the faith and his, Paul's defense of his apostleship. Uh, apparently, people had come along again after Paul had visited there and planted the church and said, why are you listening to that dumb old Paul? You know, he's not an apostle. He's not anybody significant. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And so Paul writes to straighten them out on some moral problems they had and to teach them, but also to defend his own authority, which uh, appropriately so. The book of Romans is a complete explanation of the Christian faith written to the church in Rome. We believe while he was at Corinth. We'll talk about that. Ephesians is an explanation of believer's position in Christ to the church at Ephesus. Colossians accounts for the supremacy of Christ for the church. Philemon is an appeal for Christian unity and forgiveness of a runaway slave. He's actually writing 
to a man whose slave had run away, who was a Christian, asking him to take him back as a Christian brother. Uh, Philippians is a joyful letter about Paul's faith during his imprisonment, written to the church of Philippi. First and Second Timothy are manuals of leadership for a young pastor at Ephesus. Timothy, who you remember on the second missionary journey, Paul and Silas picked up Timothy and took him along with them. And so Timothy became a traveler with Paul, a disciple of his, and ended up being a very significant. He actually was the bishop of Ephesus at one point. And then Titus, we talked about. Again, a manual for conduct for Christian leaders for a young pastor on Crete, who later became the bishop of Crete and the patron saint. So these are the books of uh, Paul, the epistles of Paul. This, again, another chart. This is the timeline from A.D. 48 to 68. It gives you... Uh, Events in his life, the first missionary journey and the visit to Galatia, Jerusalem Council, second missionary journey, third missionary journey, his trials, first Roman imprisonment, the fourth missionary journey. So the person who created this chart believes that Paul did leave Rome and go to Spain and elsewhere. And then second Roman imprisonment and martyrdom, 67, 68. And then this records when the different books were written, where they were written, etc. along that timeline. So the, all these charts are online. You can pull this stuff up and uh, make use of them. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the letters that are universally accepted as Pauline and the ones that are questioned. And by the way, I think all 13 are written by Paul. Just start that right up front. Yes? Uh, just before you go into that, uh, it's my understanding then that the Jewish uh, people who became followers of, of Jesus were Christian and the Gentiles were called Christians as well? Yes. Everybody was a Christian at that point, whether a Jew or Gentile. And when did it change over that it became a Messianic Jew and a Christian? Um, well, that's not really a designation. I mean, they're still Christians. Uh, the only reason they, did, they use that is as a clarification. That they, uh, for a Jew like today, and that's been fairly recent. That's been, you know, in the, since the 1960s or so, the 20th century. Um, it's a, a means of clarification. It's a shorthand way of saying, I'm a Jewish person that believes that Jesus is the Messiah that God promised. And so they call him a Messianic Jew, meaning uh, I, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Sometimes They used to use, I don't hear it as much anymore, the expression of completed Jew. You know, that Jesus has completed the promise of the covenant in me. All right? Um, and most of you know, because I've talked about it, Jews for Jesus is one of my clients. Um, and they are all, all the missionaries Jews for Jesus are Jewish people by heritage and by faith. You know, because Judaism, there's two, kind of, two aspects of Judaism. You're Jewish by genetics, um, mm -hmm. and then you're also Jewish in terms of your participation in the Jewish faith. You know, you can convert to Judaism even if you're not genetically Jewish. But um, all of the missionaries and Jews for Jesus and some other, uh, other Jewish organizations, Jewish Christian organizations, I'm not, I don't know the details, but Jews for Jesus, they are all Jewish people who have accepted Jesus as being the Messiah and Lord and Savior, and so they are Christian in the same way I am, but they have the additional aspect that they can look at all of the Old Testament promises to the Jewish people to send a Messiah, and those promises were for them. We got adopted into that promise, but, you know, so we're adopted into that family, but they are full-blooded members of that family in terms of being Jews who accepted Jesus as the Messiah God promised, that He is Savior and He is Lord. So it's, that's, Messianic Jew is simply a, a, a very modern shorthand to explain I'm a Jewish person that believes Jesus is the Messiah. Okay? Any, uh, any question about that? Yeah? Aren't we all Jews? Mm -mm. No, what I'm saying is if we're all inherited... From well, we're all adopted into that family, yes. Right. But again, uh, Judaism is, is a genetic thing as well, you know, but... Genetic to the extent that there are diseases that are unique to Jewish people. Tay-Sachs disease, you know, um, is only Jewish people can get it because it's, it's a, something linked to their genetic makeup. So um, they are Semitic peoples. They are a particular descent, the, the Jewish people, that we are not. Now we can, we're adopted into the family of faith that God, you know, so that when God chose the Jewish people to be his unique people amongst all peoples, we got adopted into that family. Grafted onto the vine is an expression of all uses. Okay. But not Jew. We, I don't think it's fair for us to say we're Jewish in that regard. Um, well, so. I was thinking Jewish from the regard of we're descendants from the Bible and they were Jews. Um, 
Yeah, but we're not. I mean, the, the Jewish I know people. We can't use the word yeah. for Jews, but right. if we believe in the Bible. We did inherit that. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. Um, the seven books. Let's see, where am I going? Okay. The seven books that no one questions as being uh, attributable to Paul are Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, and Philemon. Those are universally accepted as being Pauline. The ones that are disputed, and there are six of them, by some more liberal theologians, are Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, and then the three pastoral epistles, which is 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. Now, the reasons why they don't, some people don't want to accept those, is Colossians presents a Christology. Christology is a theology of the nature of Christ. Presents a Christology as the image of the invisible God, which we don't find elsewhere in Paul's writings. I don't think that's sufficient justification. I mean, Paul finds a, a, a new and meaningful way to describe the nature of Jesus there. Doesn't mean the whole rest of the book of Colossians is inconsistent with the other things Paul says. But, but liberal scholars look at that and say, that sounds more like John than it does Paul in terms of that Christology. But that's only one part of the book of Colossians. I don't believe it's sufficient to cause people to reject that. Um, Ephesians, they say, is very similar to Colossians. It doesn't do as much emphasis on the cross as the rest of Paul's writings, and so they want to reject it. The reason primarily they reject 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus uh, from the Pauline epistles is because they have trouble figuring out where they fit into the chronology. They can't quite figure out when did he write these letters and how does that fit into everything, which I don't think is sufficient justification to say that we don't believe Paul wrote them. Yes? How, how, do, they, how, do, they, how, do, they, how do they say that Ephesians is not by Paul when he opens up by saying Paul, the apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and see, that's the, one of the biggest problems we have as evangelicals is it says Paul wrote it, yeah. which means if that's a lie, if that's not true, well, can you trust? then we have a fundamental problem with the reliability of Scripture. Okay? So that's the biggest reason why, and I said in the class yesterday, before we start questioning whether something is traditionally uh, true according to the traditional interpretation or especially true to the internal testimony of Scripture, before we start saying Ephesians was not written by Paul when it says, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by special, you know, before when we start saying we don't believe that's true, the ramifications of that are extraordinary. You better have a whole lot of good reason before you do that. Now, Hebrews... I said earlier, and some people, some people rankle at that. They still want Hebrews to be written by Paul. Nowhere in Hebrews does it say Paul wrote it. The language that's used in Hebrews, the theme of Hebrews, it is so Jewish. Now, Paul was a Jew, but he was the apostle of the Gentiles. And so most of his writing, pretty much all of his writing, is oriented to something that a Jew would understand, but is very much more geared to a Gentile perception. Hebrews, the reason it's called Hebrews is because it's the most Jewish book in the New Testament. Um, the only thing that's even close to it is Matthew, in terms of his Jewishness. But, and none of the language, none of the themes, none of the imagery, none of Hebrews matches the rest of Paul's writings. Again, that doesn't mean it's, um, it's contrary to, or contradictory to, it's just a very different, it's like you're looking at a complete other side of the same coin. So it makes sense, especially because it doesn't claim to be written by Paul, to believe that Hebrews was written by somebody else we don't know who it is. One of the reasons that I, you know, our old pastor Earl Palmer and others, and Carolyn's mother, had made the decision with, before uh, Carolyn ever heard me say it, that she thought Priscilla wrote it. One of the reasons that some of us think that Priscilla might have written it is because that would explain why nobody knows who wrote it. Because they would have been reluctant to credit a woman with having written a book that everybody acknowledged as being a word from God. Because that wasn't the culture back then. Okay. Anyway, uh, but most of the reasons there are, like in the pastoral epistles, in addition to having trouble with the chronology, there there are some vocabulary in it that doesn't that is a little different than Paul's. Not radically different, just a little different. And yet, liberal scholars who need something to do, you know, got to write another book. If you, don't, if you don't publish your parish, right? And that's true. A lot of schools, if you don't have tenure, you don't get op, not, you don't get articles published, you don't get rehired. Okay? It's the sad nature of the world. And so they gotta find something that somebody's gonna publish, and the best way to get published is to have something controversial. And so this stuff comes out. Uh, it's simply the way it works. 
But again, we do have to, the job here is not just to tell you everything I think, but to give you an understanding. Of the 13 letters that are attributed to Paul in the New Testament, <coughs> not counting Hebrews, that's the 14th one, um, seven of them universally agree upon. And the seven are, for the most part, the most important ones, like Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, etc. The others are questioned for what I think are not significant reasons, and certainly not justification to deny the internal testimony of those books that they were written by Paul. Okay? But you need to know that not everybody agrees with that. Uh, you will read some documents that will say, oh, well, you know, uh, I told you, I did a memorial service in Chabala once and mentioned that Revelation, you know, I quoted from Revelation as being from the Apostle John. And if somebody came up to me afterwards and said, surely you don't believe that John wrote the book of Revelation. I said, yeah, I do. You know, I believe he wrote the Gospel, the three epistles, and the book of Revelation. Oh, well, you know, scholars don't believe that. I said, well, some scholars do. Okay. <laughs> Um, and more and more really top-rated scholars, N.T. Wright and people like that are coming along and, and people whose scholarship cannot be questioned and saying, you know, you guys have gone way overboard on this stuff. Back it up. Because there is no justification for a lot of the liberal interpretations that have dominated in the 20th century. Okay? And their scholarship is just as good as the people who have said that. All right. Now, the basic messages in Paul's writing... Uh, Primarily, Paul's emphasis in all of his writing is the death, resurrection, and lordship of Jesus Christ, which provides, which alone provides salvation for those who believe in him. So the issue of death, resurrection, atonement of Jesus, and how that is applied to our lives, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, is the fundamental truth that Paul is talking about. And it all breaks down to Paul very simply. He says, God sent his son, the Messiah, who is Jesus, the divine one. His son was crucified on the benefit, for the benefit of humanity. The son will return. In the meantime, those of us who belong to the son by accepting him in faith will live with him forever. And because we've accepted him, we have an obligation to live to a higher moral standard than the rest of the world. That's Paul's message. And... If it, if it shifts a little bit, you know, more weight on the left foot or the right foot, it's because most of Paul's letters were written to specific churches, and he's addressing specific issues related to those churches. When he writes to the church in Corinth, Corinth was having trouble with, one, uh, morality issues. A man, a guy sleeping with his mother-in-law, and the church was <coughs> taking him to task for it, or its mother-in-law, his uh, stepmother. Um, the... Uh, the, there were other immoral things going on, or they were denying the authority of Paul and coming up with a different gospel. The Galatian church Paul writes to because they were being uh, lied to by these false prophets who told them they had to be circumcised. Various issues that Paul emphasizes in one letter or the other is entirely because different churches were having different problems. And he was trying to teach them, train them, encourage them, help them through those. But his message is always rooted in the death, resurrection, atonement, ascension and atonement, or resurrection, ascension, atonement of Jesus Christ, and how as we receive the truth of that and follow him, we are saved. And then we have an obligation to live a moral life. Not because the moral life saves us, but because that's how we should act in gratitude for the salvation. Everything in Paul is wrapped around that stuff. Okay, That's his whole message. And if you had to say what one word probably reflects all of Paul's theology would be atonement. The fact that Jesus Christ atoned for our sins and we are saved in Him. It's not us that does it, you know, for by grace we are saved through faith. It is a free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, Ephesians 6. So that's Paul's message to us, okay? And we get that in all of his letters, all 13 of them <laughs> that Paul wrote for us, okay? Let's talk about the book of Romans for the next 25 minutes. The author, doggone it, is the Apostle Paul. <laughs> and again, nobody questions that one about Romans. Everybody acknowledges that Paul did write Romans, even if they doubt some of the others. We believe that it was written around A.D. 56 or 57. Again, sort of lone wolf scholars will make it slightly earlier or slightly later, but it's fairly universally believed to be around 56 or 57 A.D. The theme is the whole gospel. The book of Romans is the most complete presentation of the Christian gospel and the Christian faith in all of the New Testament. Not just Paul, but in terms of the, 
the, it is the, you know, the, the, the magnum opus, the, the big book, in other words. Um, I'll quote you from one uh, Jesuit scholar who says that the book of Romans overwhelms the reader by the density and the sublimity of the topic with which it deals, which is the gospel of the justification and salvation of Jew and Greek alike, Greek or Gentile, by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what this book is about. And it is the most complete representation of that truth that we have in the New Testament. It is the whole package. It, is, it can be quite dense to read, let's face it. Some people who, especially if they, are, if they don't have a background in reading theology, Paul, Paul is at his legalistic best. In, well, legalistic, that's the wrong word. But he, he is at his most academic, his most formal in his presentation in the book of Romans. You know, there's, he actually can get kind of lighthearted in some of his other, like Philippians. You know, the, the, the letter of, which is about love. And it's all, you know, who doesn't smile when they read the book of Philippians? You know, it's all great stuff. Or you, you get things like Corinthians 13, you know, the love chapter, whatever. Romans is dense stuff. But the very fact that it's that dense is, the, is because it carries so much weight. Um, N.T. Wright, I mentioned his name earlier. N.T. Wright is one of the prominent... Um, evangelical theologians out there today. N.T. Wright's stuff is wonderful to read if you're looking for, for a, a, scholar, a scholarly uh, Christian writer today. N.T. Wright says this about Romans. It is neither a systematic theology nor a summary of Paul's life work, but it is by common consent his masterpiece. It dwarfs most of his other writing as an alpine peak towers over hills and villages. Not all onlookers have viewed it in the same light or from the same angle, and their snapshots and paintings of it are sometimes remarkably unlike. Not all climbers have taken the same route up its sheer sides, but there is frequent and there is frequent disagreement on the best approach. What nobody doubts is that we are here, that is in Romans, dealing with a work of massive substance, presenting a formidable intellectual challenge while offering a breathtaking theological and spiritual vision. This is big stuff. Okay? The book of Romans has been, your, your textbook talks about this, the book of Romans was a major inspiration for St. Augustine in the 400s, who was one of the foremost theologians in the history of the church. It radically changed Martin Luther's perspective of what faith is all about, which led to the Protestant Reformation. It, it warmed the heart, to use his words, of John Wesley and was significant in causing him to start the Wesleyan Reformation that led to the Methodist Church. Um, it motivated Karl Barth. Karl Barth started teaching Romans and taught it for, I think it was 22 years. Every week he taught on the book of Romans. His epistle to the Romans was the death knell to liberal theology in the early 20th century and the start of a movement called Neo-Orthodoxy, which was a return to believing that the Bible is true. All of that and much, much more is because of the book of Romans. This book, if you have to pick one book in the New Testament, I mean, you know, I'm not saying leave any of them out, but if you really want to understand what Christianity is about, understanding it's not easy, you know, it's not a, it's not a light book, but if you really want to get at what the New Testament is all about, what the atonement of Jesus Christ is all about, the book of Romans will give it to you. And the purpose to prepare, you know, Paul is writing to the church in Rome. We believe he wrote it from Corinth when he was spending time there. And he, he's preparing them for his plan to visit Rome. In it, he presents the plan of salvation and explains how both Jews and Gentiles fit into God's plan. Okay? Um, a simple outline, there are three large sections to it. The revelation of God's righteousness in Jesus Christ the vindication of God's righteousness, and then the application of God's righteousness to our lives. Um, two key verses I would give you, and again, I could pick a dozen key verses real quick out of Romans, but to give you an idea, Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The, the gospel, which is the truth of Jesus Christ, who came for us and died for our sins to save us, 
That is the power of God for salvation for both Jews and Gentiles. And Romans 3, 21 to 26. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Paul makes a point, and back to something you asked earlier, John. Paul does not in this book say, throw the law away. He says the law and the prophets were, were in preparation as testimony for what was to come in Jesus Christ. So the righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Jew and Gentile, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement. There's that theme, atonement. Through faith in His blood, He did this to demonstrate His justice, because in His forbearance, He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So, this is what the book of Romans is all about for us. The atonement of Christ for Jew or Gentile. It is the whole package. Again, uh, we, um, John Calvin said all of the gospel is written in this book and, if, and we could do no better than to spend every day meditating on the truth of the book of Romans. All right? uh, I want to do a real quick outline so you have sort of a sense of what you're looking at as you go through the book of Romans. Paul, in, it starts with an introduction, as he always does. He then goes into his theme, and the theme is the righteousness of God. He starts out by saying God is righteous. He then counterpoints that by saying all people are unrighteous. God is righteous and holy, we are not. And then he breaks it down. And the, the arguments, the, the presentation and arguments in Romans are so methodical and so brilliantly presented. God is righteous, people are not righteous, and then he breaks that down to say Gentiles are unrighteous. Now all the Jews were with him right up to that point. But then he comes back and says, but the Jews also are unrighteous. And then he sums it up and says, in fact, no one is righteous, not one, nobody. And then he comes back and says, but God's righteousness has been imputed to us, means it's been transferred to us. It has been done through Christ. Christ, the Son of God, who came, brought the righteousness of God for us. We receive that righteousness that has been transferred to us by our faith. And then he establishes that as the principle by which we're saved. And then he illustrates that truth. And then he starts talking about, and what is the fruit of that? What then happens once we, by faith, receive the righteousness of God that has been imputed? And then he summarizes it all. He ties it all up in the fifth chapter, saying that all of humanity's unrighteousness compared to all of God's gift of righteousness <clears throat> confront each other in the nature of the atonement offered by Jesus Christ. Okay. He then continues, <clears throat> and he talks about the fact that, again, God's righteousness is imparted, that we are given by God's righteousness imparted by Jesus Christ a freedom from the tyranny of sin, that we are under the bondage of sin. We are slaves to sin. But by the grace given in Jesus Christ, we can be freed from that. We are freed from the condemnation that came under the law. The law was given to make us aware that we are not able to live up to the righteousness of God. And then God gave us a plan by which, recognizing that we couldn't live up to it, we did not have to be under the condemnation of that. And that once we receive that righteousness and are no longer under sin, are no longer under condemnation, then we have the right and the ability to live by the power of the Holy Spirit, to live a completely different life. We don't live a righteous life in order to be just, in order to make ourselves okay for God. We allow the righteousness of God to be imparted to us by Jesus, so that then the Holy Spirit can allow us to live a righteous life. He then talks about the righteousness of God vindicated in history. The justice of God's rejection of Israel, that Israel's rejection of Jesus has caused God to judge them. And why that rejection has occurred, because they did not obey God first and then they did not receive His Son. But that that rejection of the Jewish people by God, both because they did not fulfill their commitment to the law and they did not receive Jesus, that that rejection is neither complete nor is it final. 
The, the, the chapter has not been closed on the Jews coming to a belief in Jesus Christ, is what Romans is saying. Even now there is a remnant of Jewish people who believe in the Messiah. I work with a lot of those people. And the rejection that God has is only temporary, that a time will come. And the promise in Romans is a time will come when the Jewish people will turn to the Messiah. And the people that I work with, the Jews for Jesus, that's, that's the flag they wave all the time. That we are soldiers in the process of bringing it to the fulfillment of the promise of Romans, that the Jewish people will turn to the Messiah. And that God's ultimate purpose is not judgment, it is not rejection, it is mercy. God wants people to be saved. He wants the Jewish people to return to him by accepting his son, and we as the Gentiles get to come along. Then the practice of righteousness in the body, which is the church, in the world, as we interact with the world, and then among both weak and strong Christians, that God, by his spirit, will uh, teach righteousness to us in our strength and in our weakness. He then has a conclusion, tying it all up, and then commendation, greetings, and doxology, where he says, you know, he, he uh, I think there's um, 21 people, I think it is, that he says, sends greetings to at the end of this book. Uh, there were a lot of Christians in Rome at that point, right? Um, Peter's not one of them, you know, uh, which, is, which people have commented on. Uh, either Peter wasn't there then, or the falling out that Peter and Paul had over how Peter was teaching, uh, treating the Gentiles, they were still upset at each other. We don't know. But this is the most comprehensive, complete, detailed presentation of the atonement of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news that we find anywhere. Questions about that? Have you read this book? Mm -hmm. um, again, I recommend that you read it um, if you haven't gotten into Romans a lot, uh, if you're new to it, I would suggest you do it with a good study Bible, like an NIV study Bible or something, because you will come across concepts or verses that, you know, where he's talking about justification or sanctification. And Paul uses big theological words in this. In this. And a commentary, a, a Bible that has commentary notes will help you understand it as you go along. But if you don't take anything else away from this class, take away that the book of Romans should be core curriculum for you. Uh, if we had somebody else teaching classes that I didn't have to teach, you know, 24, 25, 26, whatever it is, courses, I'd be teaching the class just in Romans. All right? We'd be focusing on that as one book. I don't have that luxury, unfortunately, but uh, take it seriously. You guys spend some time with this. I, unless you have ever really lived under legalism as a Christian, and, and which I have, it's hard to imagine the impact that Romans has if you've been taught grace all your life. Right. Because it is so transforming to suddenly realize that you are not bound by the law. And to see that, you know, I had, you were talking about a class in Romans when I was in the Bible college. Uh, it was in the Romans class. Our Romans pro professor actually was touched by the grace of God. And he, you know, he was so legalistic every day, and one morning he came in in tears. And Romans had touched him in that class and totally transformed his life. Right. And that's what it can do, because so many times, you know, we want to live by both grace and law. We're, we're okay with Jesus, and then, and then, then okay, we're going to try again. We try to live by the law, and then, oh, doggone, I failed, I'll run back to Jesus. And it's like, no, Jesus is there all the time. Yes, we're free. And we are being free. Yeah, we're yeah. totally free. And it just is so transforming and it makes you so appreciative of what you have. You can't get over it. And this is why Augustine, Luther, uh, Calvin, Wesley, Bart, these people, their whole, you know, their whole lives were changed. And, and so much, all of them are responsible for major movements. And those movements were were significantly based upon the effect that the book of Romans had on their lives. Um, you know, it's not to say that there wasn't an impact on Luther and the others from, from the other books of the Bible, but Romans, more than any other single book, is the one that really changed those men and led them in the direction that made significant, you know, significant impact on the body of Christ in the world. Right. I, I was really almost shocked uh, in, in reading Romans, the first chapter, as I shared with you that he, the 
language he used to say that how silly people are mm -hmm. to to see the creation and not know God, not right. give him credit for it. Yeah, and we were talking earlier about people who don't like Paul because they think Paul didn't like women, which is not true. We'll get to that. Or, you know, Paul's statements about practicing homosexuality was not acceptable, or whatever other reason. There are people, even ministers, who won't have anything to do with Paul. They won't preach from Paul, they won't read Paul, they won't study Paul. Which means they miss the book of Romans. You know, it's it's they're they're limping through on one one leg at best in terms of what their understanding of the faith is. Uh, and sinning in the process. Yes. Plus I just wanted to add these comments. There are some things that are really worth fighting for, mm -hmm. struggling to, to apprehend. And the understanding of Romans <clears throat> is one of those things. It's worth trying it's working worth, at. It's it worth fleshing it out and, and spending the time. Who was it? Paul? I mean, was, uh, Luther said he, 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 he wrestled with, with Paul until he would release the meaning of this verse in Romans yeah. 1 17. So yeah. that's. It's, yeah. it's a book worth the fight. And it can be work, but it is well worth the work. That's, that's why I recommend you use probably a, a, a Bible, study Bible with good commentary notes on it to help you through it. But spend some time with the Book of Romans. I mean, that's your, Book of Romans is part of your reading for this week. And uh, I know a lot of you hadn't seen the reading list, but catch up on that. Spend some time in Romans this week. And you can read Romans and Corinthians, uh, First and Corinthians as well. It's not that much. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? All right. Appreciate it. I'm going to let you go about six minutes early here. So thank you, and I will see you next week.